<laughs> no, tell them. Tell them. If they're not watching the visuals, they need to know. Hi, so if you're watching the visuals, you see it's like 10 in the morning. <laughs> I'm in some glittery shirt with no particular reason, but look at it. <laughs> No, I that person does not dress up from the bottom down. No, you just see the, the upper part and that's it. I record from my own house. Some might have thought I would see a pimple on my chest and be like, yeah, let's cover that. Let's choose the adequate piece of clothing to cover that. No, even my Christmas tree is not down yet. Welcome to February, everybody. <laughs> Professional, professional podcasting voice. Thank you for witnessing my meltdown. This is by all means necessary. My name is Maya. I'm your host. Ah, good. So to get myself out of this meltdown, hi Finnish people. I have flown by Finnish Air once because like I missed a flight and then I had to book one and transfer also through Helsinki. I was impressed by everything. Also, I just, I have a few questions. Is your country as impressive as the airport? Because then it's the first on my list once this lockdown is lifted. I'm I'm done. I'm going. (laughs) Fuck it. Is it that impressive? But also, is flying on Finnish air always extra cold? Like, do you guys not do do the heating? Because that's one thing that I never googled afterwards. But it was the one flight that was the most bitching cold. They give you blankets and it's super comfortable. And I was impressed. It was like TV, you watch it. I was like, whoa, this is the life. But then the temperature just started like decreasing. It kind of felt like the temperature of the air around you. And I was like, okay. Am I gonna freeze to death? So hey Finnish people, is it always that cold? They switch on the heating or do they justify it like by law that they give you a blanket and then you know you won't freeze to death? Something along those lines, right? Tell me, hit me up, podbam at gmail.com. I'm gonna go. Uh, I wanna go anywhere. Okay. Uh, the light this the light this is gonna go off real quick because we're covering such a gruesome case. Please, it was your choice. I asked you on Twitter. I ran a survey, both on Twitter and Instagram. Do you want female criminals or do you want Philly sites? Because I was like, February. February has so many crimes, starting with F, like that are actually a pool. Like family annihilators, femicides, Philly sites, (laughs) father sides. Sure, yeah. You know, fraternity sites, female criminals, everybody. Everything bad that happens starts with the word F. We had the light month now. This one is going to be heavy. I had no idea how heavy can it be. This is giving me Kelly Lane vibes all throughout. And you're gonna go through a roller coaster of emotions, just like me. And in order for us to lull ourselves into the environment, I have some Finnish expressions for you today. So I'm doing the thing that I have done last week for Henry Van Breda, like when I went through Australian expressions, even though the case was South African, listen, I don't choose the rules. No, you are actually the only person that chooses the rules, Maya. Cool. <laughs> Glad we clarified that in a very weird way. Now that we have that clarified, I have found a channel also, Finnish people. If you're not following this guy, I mean, you probably all know about this guy. Maybe, maybe not. My, the population is, <laughs> is higher than his number of subscribers. Shut the fuck up. Just shut up. Shut up. And like, continue. <laughs> continue. So this channel is called Very Finnish Problems, and I was looking for Finnish expressions, and this guy had a couple that were around the pattern, and the pattern was the word sauna, and I was like, there can't be, there can't be a few expressions with the word sauna, no, you Finnish people, you invented this motherfucker, of course there's gonna be a few expressions with the word sauna. So the Finns, you would like to know, don't say something vanished into thin air. They said it disappeared like a fart in Sahara. So this is the one that's not with someone. I just found it before that. <laughs> Which, I mean, come on, I love the witness. It's like vanished into thin air is so basic. It's, it's just the next basic. But disappeared and fart is like, you have to go. You have to use your imagination. Go to the Sahara. Imagine you farted there and then how it disappeared into that warm air. So the expression is kadota Queen Pieru Saharan. Saharan. Also, for the preparation of this, I have listened to this woman, True Crime Finland. If you're not listening to the podcast, go for it. She does it, you know, without all of these sidelines and extra topics and talking about her personal life. So it's it's one of those podcasts, but she does it so, like, eloquently. It's in English, obviously. And Finnish accent is just so... I love it. I love it. Because the very Finnish problems, the guy is British, but he lives in Helsinki now. 
But this girl, I was like, Finland, Finnish accent. Adopt me, somebody. <laughs> Don't it's too cold. I want to be adopted into a warm country. Then what was the point of saying it? Cool. Other expressions now with sauna. When a Finn is angry, they won't say they're going to kill you. They will offer to take you behind the sauna. So it will sound something like Vieta sauna taxe. Or they're going to say there's room behind sauna. So if somebody kind of tells you in Finnish there's room behind sauna or they're going to take you behind the sauna, you should you should freak the fuck out. That's why I'm telling you in Finnish as well. Learn these, learn these. <laughs> this is the equivalent and truly represents like the economic state of the country. Back home you say take somebody behind the shed. <laughs> and I think this is in most Balkan countries as well. <laughs> that just gives you the idea of how poor we are and how great Finnish people are doing. <laughs> and this is because the oldest known saunas in Finland were made from pits dug in a slope in the ground and were primarily used as like dwells or dwellings in winter. So that's why it made sense back in the day to say it. But now you just sound smart. You're like, mm, I actually know it. I'm gonna use this sauna fucking expression. Now Finns even have the word for sauna beer. And sauna beer is kind of normalized because it's apparently a good way to hang with your friends. It's not like, wow, what Americans or Russians or whatever would consider like to be a really gay experience. No, you say, you know, let's have a sauna beer. It's kind of like when you're moderately drinking. And it's called a sauna kalja or sauna kalja. Which one is it? <laughs> but the best one, the most vivid here, like, this is why I love Finnish. That's why I love Finnish people, because they just have such great imagination. I just know it from these freaking expressions. Is when you say Finn wooden strips of a thousand pussies. And uh, yeah, it's those kind of pussies. Human pussies. No, it's not cats. So when you say to Han and Pilun Paret, you're basically saying something has gone wrong. And why? What could have gone wrong? Well, women used to sit on these thin wooden strips. And you guessed it, that was in saunas, but when they had their periods. So the blood would basically, you know, go on to <laughs> the wooden strips. And that would be considered for something to, to have gone terribly wrong. Because it's blood in a sauna. It smells, it's dry blood, it will smell. And then it dripped the freaking thing, and then somebody else is sitting in blood. Y you guessed it. Like, you probably could have pictured that myself, but I just had to make sure that you did. Ah, now, no interlude. Going straight into the grim stuff. Going straight for Philly sites. So I decided not to cover the most famous ones, like the ones of Andrea Yates or Susan Smith, but I'm still gonna briefly tell you what happened and what motivated those people. And then I'll cover the three Philly sites that were a lot less famous for us to kind of distinguish between the motives. And also I plan to cover one, because usually in Philly sites the perpetrator is a mother, uh, but it's kind of completely different when a father kills a son or a daughter, like it happens later in life, it's for different motives, so I plan to cover definitely one father-inflicted filicide. <sighs> it's all green from now on. I'm gonna tell you what the parts are where you might struggle to breathe. I would actually advise taking these episodes in like 10 minute intervals, so like pause it, go do something. That is literally how I was researching. I was like, had a paragraph when I would, I'd read an article and they'd be like, whoa, la la la. I was so productive. I washed way too many dishes this week compared to any other research that I have done. Because boy, so Andrea Yates, she was the one that was most unstable. She drowned her five children. And she has done it because she believed that her children weren't developing right. So they were not righteous and they weren't developing right intellectually So in school. She killed them because she believed they would never be right because she personally has ruined them due to how she was mothering them. She managed to even convince herself that one of her sons, Luke, would become a mute homosexual prostitute and her other son, John, would become a serial murderer. So she kind of believed it started as a delusion and then believed more and more into it until she convinced herself that there is nothing else left to do but to kill them. She thought after she drowned her children, she would be arrested and executed. She also believed that Satan would be executed along with her, and then that would further save the world, or like save other children of straying away from the good paths and shit. 
So she kind of thought like she was making a pact where she would drown these children, but then they would go to heaven because they were still innocent. They still haven't committed any of these crimes. And if she was to let them to commit any of these crimes, then obviously the Satan would be like on their side. They might actually end up in hell. Her motive was to ensure that her children would not go to hell and her filicides would fit a category by preventing an eternity of suffering. We will speak about the motive. There are a couple of categories when it comes to filicides where people can fit in and they are certainly spot on in so many cases, like in this one as well. Then the other bad mother was Susan Smith with a headline that stated that Susan Smith committed the mother of all crimes. Where I'm like, okay, journalist, I see what you try to do here, but get get it together. Get, get it together. Get it out of your system in, like, sidelines or before you actually write the, the, the core of the article. This is, again, why I'm not doing journalism, because I can't stray away from that. So I would be like, oh, my God, this is such a great plan. She's the mother of all crimes. It's like, oh, what was her crime? Oh, she killed her son. No, that's not how life works. So in 1994, Susan Smith reported that her two sons... Oh, this one angers me so much. So one was aged 14 months and the other one was three years old. had been kidnapped by a black carjacker. But after nine days of law enforcement searching for another black guy, the police was going to convict of this crime that he was innocent for, she revealed she actually rolled the car into the lake with her sons strapped in their car seats. This is the one in the true crime community that infuriates a lot more people because, well, you can see why. Because Andrea Yates, you can see that it was psychological. You can see that there was a lot of mental health. It doesn't make it sound better because she drowned her five children to death. But in this case, it's like, okay, nothing you say next is going to justify what you have done because you clearly weren't the one in the car. You also try to blame it on somebody else. There's a bit more complex emotions going on here. She said she planned to drown herself with them as well, but changed her mind at the last moment. You didn't change your mind when it came to the life of your freaking kids. Why, bitch? So that day, the trigger was that she was rejected by the men that she loved. So according to the prosecution, the motives for her actions were unwanted child filicide. So it falls under that category, meaning she wished to get rid of her children in an attempt to increase the chances of having a relationship with a man that did not want anything to do with her. This man didn't want to marry her because she was a woman with children. And because of this, the jury didn't give her death penalty, but sentenced her to life in prison. So at least she's just there forever. I just find it super... It's, it's just another level of selfish and passing on the guilt to a black man because you know that that's who like, somebody would suspect and they're going to believe your white-ass story. Now, with Susan Smith, I'm just like... Not to mention that I hate mothers the most when I see... like, And you see it in small degrees and you see it in huge degrees. When the mothers do believe, like, oh no, it's actually my fault that I have children. It's like, no, he is coming into your fucking life. It's your choice who you let into your fucking life. If they have a problem with children, get the fuck out. Get them out. Like, no. Women that choose their partners over their children, I just can't comprehend. Don't don't have the child then. Just don't. If you know you can't put, like, somebody else as a priority, don't. Just, just don't do it. Now, a morbidly interesting fact before we dive into this case, the most common methods of infanticides or filicides are battering, so using force, smothering, strangling, and drowning. And the method is weirdly connected to the age of the victim. So homicides of infants and young children are typically committed using personal weapons, so like hand or feet, and rarely involve like firearms, knives, or just any other weapons. However, older children are usually killed with these types of weapons. And mothers in particular often prefer drowning, suffocation, or gassing their victims to death. Now moving on to the case of the week. We are going to Oulu, which is like north of Finland. And it was one of those cities founded in 1605. So as our lady Mina from True Crime Finland said, it was the oldest city and the most populous one in the north of Finland. <sighs> Brace yourselves, fuckers. Brace your fucking selves. In 2014, the police discovered that Kaisa Fernanem Karaduman killed five of her infants, leaving them to die. For nine years, she concealed their bodies, evading the justice by all means necessary. What were her motives?
This week you're stepping into the shoes of an estate manager. This estate manager was in charge of this apartment block and she smelled something foul and like other people obviously in the estate have complained about the smell. So she's like, okay, cool, fuck it, I manage this, <laughs> manage this bitch. I need to make a call here. So she breaks the door to the storage room and finds three packages. So it's three packages. It looks like plastic bags, but like whatever is inside is covered well, so she can't see what it is. And she carries them out to the basement and calls 112, so calls the police. So the police, because again, this is a small place, nothing like this has ever happened. The police is like, okay, I mean, can it be like rotten meat? Like, let's run through some options here. Like, what the fuck would it be when it's that small? And it's like free packages. Like, is it just somebody, you know, didn't put the meat in the freezer? Kind of giving them the vibe of like, why are you alerting us? Like, this doesn't seem, this doesn't seem serious. So this estate manager is like, no, like, I'm not opening this by myself, it smells foul, I know when something doesn't smell like rotten meat versus, like, the smell of freaking death. So the police is like, oh, we're, we're gonna get there. They arrive, and by this point, the building tenants were all kind of in the yard surrounding this, being like, you know, drama, let us in on the gossip, like, nothing ever happens here. And they were about to open the packages when Kaisa, Fernanda and Karadumam, she comes out and she's like, listen, don't open the packages there. And they all look at her like, uh-huh, okay. So she tells the police that she's going to open the packages, she's going to let them in on the story, but they should open them in her apartment. So the police goes with her and everything starts unfolding. In the apartment, she opens these packages and they find out that they actually contain the bodies of five, not three, five infants. She was 35 at the time and was immediately arrested and detained on suspicion of manslaughter and concealment of corpse. And obviously the forensics come and take these packages. It was three packages with plastic bags with tape and then there was five containers in those bags, all wrapped inside a towel. And when DNA tests were performed, they realized that all of the kids came from different dads. And Kaisa at the time was married, she was a working woman, she had no criminal history, and friends just said, like, they had no suspicions. Again, ringing the Kelly Lane bells real hard here. We're gonna speak about it, because this is the part where I'm like, really? Really? Nobody has suspicions. Five. Pregnancies. Really? You have no friends. Listen to me. I'm so fed up with this and I will probably be more fed up because I'm covering two more cases this month. If no friend of you notices a pregnancy of yours, you have no friends. It's as simple. It's as simple as that. Sorry to break to you. What are your friends and what are your family? <laughs> no. So the one in 2011 was her husband's child and she seemed to be looking forward to it. However... Her husband, from what Mina from Chukan Finland was saying, was basically like traveling for work, and he also was from a different country. It's not stated. The guy probably doesn't want to freaking associate himself with this case, to be honest. So the husband would travel for work, or he would be traveling to like visit his family in the country. In which time she would basically schedule it according to that, although it's a fucking pregnancy, you can't schedule it. At that time, she would give birth alone at home. And immediately to the police, she started saying, like, no, 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 I'd give birth alone at home. But all of these children were both prematurely, they were dead at birth, so she didn't think, you know, she would alert anybody or anything like that, or go to hospital, and she got rid of the problem herself. They established he didn't father two of the kids, and he was on trips, or they were arguing... And actually nobody knew that she was pregnant for those two kids. And her own dad, so Kaisa's own dad, was only aware of one pregnancy. It was a loving family, like she had a normal relationship with her husband. Again, the grandparents loved this son. She had an alive kid that was 14 at this time. No issues, seemed like a normal fucking family. So I'm just thinking, what is going on in your head that once you realize you're pregnant, you suddenly can't tell anybody? Like, how does that switch happen? But also, what the fuck goes through your head when, like, your husband lives on a business trip and you have to give birth at home? I am just... I have changed my opinion so much on, like, home births and how easy these women make it seem. 
The research on the filicides actually is making me shift my opinions on both pregnancies and home births, because how easy are they making it seem? But seriously, like, nobody teaches you, and even, like, I suspect there are no videos that are going into that depth of, like, surge, like, cutting umbilical cord, like, making sure the child is born alive, like, not doing any damage to yourself, you know, because you need to recover after that, man. That's another thing, like, I, are you telling me these husbands are not noticing that the wife is suddenly, you know, I don't know, having postpartum depression, not wanting to get laid? People focus on the grim stuff, but they don't focus on, like, no. Something is going on through her freaking head. She's doing all of this by herself. She feels the need. She needs to do this by herself. Not be able to tell anybody. And then just, what, continue with her life? Like, nothing happened here. You gave five births. Five extra births to what people are aware of. And she felt, after giving, like, that second birth, right? Like, so, the first one that she left to die... She couldn't go to health checks any longer, so she had to hide other pregnancies. Again, contraception. Fuck it. But she had to hide other pregnancies because, obviously, if she was to go to health check, somebody would realize that she was pregnant again, and then they would be suspicious, and then the investigation would be open. So, as much as I'm like, okay, this this person is clearly mentally ill, there are certain points in her thinking when I'm just like, okay, this kind of does seem a bit more premeditated. None of this should have happened. You were thinking reasonably. You knew you were pregnant. It's not like you were completely delusional till the very end. No. You also gave birth at home, making sure that nobody else is there. So what happened here? She would give birth. She would wrap a child in a towel while they were, like, alive, fending for themselves, probably crying, dying, or just purely being left, like, to die in hunger. So she would wrap them in a towel. And then her first storing place was the freezer. But then they had to get rid of this freezer. So again, in her mind, what is going on through your head? She's like, okay, I need to store them somewhere else. But then obviously every other place in the house was a warm place, which means the smells would start showing up. So instead, she transfers them from the freezer. She would put them in sauna buckets. Yes, suddenly those sauna expressions don't seem so friendly, do they? So she would wrap them, put them in a sauna bucket, and then... She put them in the ground. However, throughout this period of 9 to 10 years, they actually moved houses. So she moved all of her dead children with her. Just let that sit the fuck in, because this is one of the most disturbing things I have said on this podcast. So she's moving locations within the house. And then she's moving them with herself. Dead infants that she left eye by herself. So angry. So beyond, beyond everything. As I have let sleep up here, because I i can't have suspense with this one, she was telling people that they were stillborn. So, in her head, this was justified. So on the surface, not a lot better. However, when you actually think about her boring a stillborn who's already dead, versus her leaving a small infant that just needs care, just needs to be fed, can't do that for themselves to die for a couple of days because the investigation would reveal it took between one and four days for a small child to die so they can still survive for at least a couple of days depending obviously where they were buried where they were put in then it becomes a lot more serious it gives a lot more anxiety thinking about it and obviously it's completely two different things so is she lying is she not lying they have to prove it Before going to trial and me telling you what the fuck happened in this story, let's just focus for a split second again on the friends and the family. Did anybody know? Of course, they're gonna say they didn't. So friends and family saw her wearing loose clothes, but they didn't think that maybe something happened. Also, the friends kind of like when they interviewed them said like, well, we thought maybe something bad happened, kind of insinuating maybe a miscarriage or something, because then suddenly she would, you know, snap out of the loose clothes phase and start dressing normally. But then they didn't want to intrude and ask. These ain't real friends. These are some colleague bullshit. This, this This ain't real friends, lady. The boss of hers also asked her, again, probably to check, like, do you need a maternity leave? Like, hey, are you pregnant? You know, we kind of need to find a cover, I I suppose he would ask in that sense. 
And she said no. The last night, she just ate some greasy pizza. <laughs> this bitch. This bitch is pulling a food baby stunt. This is a food baby stunt. It's like, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> she actually, and, and they didn't question that further. That, that is the part that you can't make up. It's not the part that she was like, oh no, I just ate greasy pizza. Is that they believed in it. Like They were like, oh, okay. Food baby is what I have, ladies and gentlemen, not what, like, a nine-month pregnant woman has. I have a feeling it's different. I've seen athletes get pregnant. It's still different in terms of a food baby. I put in the script, again, appropriate. I'm never again gonna complain when my parents tell me that I have gained weight. Never again. I'm like, no, they, they notice me. They notice me as a human. They notice how I look. Then they notice how I look now. Fuck it. I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. I'll be like, okay, okay, hey, at least, at least it's not the real one, mom. <laughs> Listen, let's just all be thankful for a second here. At least I'm just fine. It's fine. And we go to trial. The main, obviously, the crucial point of the trial, which will going to determine her verdict, is were the babies alive? So the prosecutors allege that during her pregnancies, she searched the information online about how to cut the umbilical cord. She also wore loose clothing, kind of saying, like, she, she knew. She knew she was pregnant, and she was concealing it on purpose. It seems from everything that I have seen that it's once she gives birth that she goes into this thing where she disassociated and starts not remembering things. Now, she actually is kind of like in a different phase where she doesn't remember and she completely like snapped out, blocked that out of her memory. I'm not sure. So she didn't remember what she did with the umbilical cord. Correct me if wrong here, but first you cut the umbilical cord and then you tie it. That kind of seems logical to me. Again, it can be the other way around. Because, you know, belly button, right? That seems logical. This is where she caved and said it's possible she did the opposite, but one is doable, the other one isn't. In court, she also wrote this letter stating that she was just functioning as a machine at that point. She felt like there was no way out. She felt sorrow, panic, desperation, anxiety. And she was literally reading this letter out in court and they were all like, there's not a relatable factor in this lady. There's just nothing. She said she felt alone and developed a version of herself in order to wake up in the morning and then continue with her normal life that she didn't want to harm the kids and doesn't think common sense was present, but chaos took over, so she made a decision in panic state to preserve the bodies. Again, remember, she is saying they were stillborn. Not a day has gone by that she doesn't think about the kids and pain has increased. She's sorry from the bottom of her heart for the pain that she put her friends and her kid, that they have to endure it. I know this sounds like a broken translation because it's obviously like a translation from a completely different language, so you don't get it. But from what I get, this part sounds like somebody being like, oh, I'm sorry about how that made you feel. So it, she's completely like disconnected from, no, this is actually wrong. Like, no, 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 I have done the wrong thing myself and then continue to do it for 10 years instead of, I, I'm sorry how I made my own child feel and like everybody around me that they had to endure it now and live with the fact that they know me. The defense focused on the pregnancies and all of them seemed viable, meaning that they all went through till the very end. Like she had no complications that would cause her to go to the hospital or even have a health check. But the real kicker, and this is so interesting and something that I probably didn't need to know, but we need to know it for this case. Where all the truth lied, whether the babies were alive or dead, was their teeth. There was a particular layer underneath the gums, and this is going to determine if your kids were born alive. So all of them were born alive and actually lived several days to fend for themselves. So you know how like babies are obviously, you know, born without teeth, then they start growing. So they even from the gums, from the layer underneath them, they can determine were they first of all born alive and did they live for any time? Like did that layer develop even a bit into what would become eventually a tooth? So what they brought to trial was that with the investigation determining that the children were born were born alive in the years 2005, five, seven. At the turn of the year 2011 and 12, 2012 and 2013. Meaning she had 
these two pregnancies literally one after the other. Like she got out of one, immediately got into the other one, the 2011 and 12 ones. They were born in the apartments in her neighborhood. The causes of death were not determined because the bodies weren't severely degraded, but there was nothing saying that she actually inflicted the deaths. Like she didn't strangle them, she didn't better them in any way. I don't know what's worse. I don't know what's worse, but like she just let these kids die alive, buried in a freezer or a bucket. According to the prosecutor, Kaisa would give birth in the bathroom or the toilet. She would wrap the babies in plastic bags, put them in a bucket, close the bucket, and then took it to the basement. In two instances, she claimed she used a sauna bucket and then a shoebox instead of a normal bucket. Very selective memory, Kaisa. Because, like, you snap out of certain situations, like, I don't know how I cut the umbilical cord. You know, that's a selective thing that kind of determines whether you know that the child was stillborn or not. But this is the part you remember, so what, definitely a stillborn, definitely not crying or anything when you put it in a bucket. It's the selectiveness of the memory where I'm like, I am not sure I'm fully on board with you just being mentally ill. I'm just not sure here at this point. Also five children, also ten years, also moving houses, very selective. And then they proceed to tell the timeline. So she would clean up after herself, conceal the infant's bodies in containers, after which she just continued with her everyday life, went to work as normal. When she changed residences, she took the bodies with her, and eventually she stored them in the cellar of the apartment block where she lived until she was discovered in June that year. So the court ended up ruling that on the basis of dental examinations, at least some of the babies have lived up to four days before dying in a bucket where she had left them. So grim. So grim. Oh my god. So grim on so many levels. So many levels. Because I try to put myself in those situations and like snap out of it. You know, having an imagination can really be a motherfucking curse in certain cases. Really, it could really be a bitch. Leading me to, I know that they have done like all of the examinations and stuff, and that she was at the house by herself at those points, but those babies would be crying for days. Again, even if you are in a state of shock or like you snapped out of the reality, a cry of a baby would bring you to it, would bring you back to it. I just do not, I don't trust this woman. Whatever she's saying, I don't trust it. Sorry. I don't trust it, don't buy it. So when that part particularly was brought in court, she said like everybody felt lifeless because it didn't move or cry. So according to her, it was only later that she learned that the babies had been alive. Bullshit, 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 bullshit. So the court found that she acted deliberately in the deaths of the babies and concluded that she was criminally responsible for the acts although she did suffer mixed personality disorder. So, on June 15th that year, the district sentences her to life imprisonment. Now I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> that's great. Life imprisonment, ladies and gentlemen, in Finland is 15 years. <sighs> I was, I lost my plot. I lost it, I lost it. I went to wash the dishes, I lost it. 15 years for this, five, five minutes. So, after losing my plot, I was like, okay, I understand. It's, you know, progressive country. You work on rehabilitation. Those people can be put back into the society. Hear me out, though. Hear me out. I understand she might not be endangering others. So this, again, doesn't seem logical. Life imprisonment 15 years this doesn't seem illogical. But, okay, you know what you're doing. Clearly, it's been working so far. This particular case, or any particular case of Philly's side, where she would be endangering herself and the babies, any future babies, how about, shocker, shocker, shocker moment, wait until she reaches menopause. The body works itself out. Anatomy, nature, science. Wait until motherfucking menopause. And then let her out. Because, yeah, she won't be endangering other kids, but she might still get pregnant. 
She's still in her 30s. If you let her the fuck out, she will be in what? In her 40s. At best, did she reach her menopause? Maybe check that before letting this bitch out. Check it. <laughs> I put in the script, this is the level of trust when people during the pandemic are like, no, but we should meet up. Everybody's meeting up. And you're like, organ- or you organize a freaking party. And I'm like, okay, I- I'm fine with you playing with your fucking life, but can you guarantee me? That like what if I go out catch the fuck that I'm gonna live? Okay, can you guarantee me that? Because if you can guarantee me that, but if you can't, then then we can talk. Like this is the logic of those people. I'm like really, really? Like she gonna get out? She not gonna get pregnant again? Please. I think in the end, by the appeals, they still managed to drop that to like thirteen years, or she was sentenced to thirteen years because of like some leeway. So basically, in Finland, if the prerequisites are not fulfilled, but the homicides seem to be deliberate and premeditated. The convict is given second degree murder, so that's minimum of eight years. Wild. Wild. Then there's also voluntary manslaughter, which is punished by four to ten years. Then involuntary manslaughter with a maximum punishment of two years imprisonment or a fine. You can get the fine for the manslaughter. And infanticide caused by the mental stress at birth gives a punishment of at least four months and at most four years in prison. So I think like they still managed to kind of take two years off her sentence because of some leeway on this. I don't understand the legal system again. I think at her, I think at the point of her release, she will be in menopause and she won't be able to have any further children. But Jesus fucking Christ, what is this? So going into background, there's not much in terms of the background on her except that even her parents and like people that know her described her as a pathological liar her dad actually said like she was lying from the very early age which (laughs) doesn't mean she was a great fucking liar it just means the public wasn't noticing anything around them how do i know that the greasy pizza bit the fact that people bought that (laughs) no no I'm not putting it past the people. No, she is the problem, but she's not a great liar for somebody who has been lying since childhood. <sighs> or she is the best liar ever because she has gotten away with this for like 10 years. You know, one or the other. Apparently you don't have to be a great liar to be a pathological fucking one. And Dad also said that she was only in contact with him recently, so before she was discovered, if she needed money. Again, she was probably isolating herself from everybody the best way that she could, trying to live a normal life, seeming a normal life, so she doesn't fall under suspicion, which in my mind, again, cool, mental illness, but also premeditation. And in junior high, her friends, if she ever had any, again, told her that she um, had a problem, because she was lying even about the smallest things. That's the bit that always got me, because I'm the person that doesn't necessarily lie, but like I can exaggerate a story in order for it to sound like more dramatic, etc., but when people start lying about like the smallest of things, like, oh, no, 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 I, I got up and then I, I went, you know, to like Starbucks, like I go to Starbucks every day, or, like, oh my God, I drink this many coffees. You're like, why? Why are you lying about this? Like, like I'm not going to be like, they're like, oh my gosh, she's so rich, she can have Starbucks every day. <laughs> it's that type of thing where you're like, why lie about the small things? Like, lie about the big one? No, please. <laughs> It's like lie when it matters. No. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't listen to me. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> then I put in the script. Then she went to La La Land when she got married and pregnant. I will never watch that movie. But purely, purely because of the title. If a movie is titled La La Land, I, I, there's no business for me to like even open that because this is what I picture that somebody has gone to La La Land. I have no idea what that movie is about. Is is it a musical? (laughs) It kind of gives me those vibes. Also, like, after all of this, after the trial, the the husband petitioned for divorce immediately after, like, the bodies were discovered. So even before her verdict was done, probably, like, changed his name, fucking disassociated with this whole story. And that's that on the story of Olu child murders. Now, what motivated this? What can motivate somebody to get this delusional, to commit any filicides, to do any of this? Just wanted to have a moment here because people who research this are true heroes. I don't know how you do it. I have no clue how you do it. But honestly, 
insane amount, insane amount of respect. Because thinking about like quantitative versus qualitative like research and what they had to do, like they probably had to like interview people, take samples, look deeper into like the issues and the background for all of these people, which just means like traumatizing themselves. I hope all of you get therapy as well, because this is insane. So motives for child murder is five. Fatal maltreatment, which is the most common type, and that's when the child is killed as the result of abuse or neglect. Partner or spouse revenge, like the one with Susan Smith, so that's the least common type. Parent kills a child to exact revenge on a partner or ex-partner. Unwanted child, so that's most common motive in the United side, and the child is seen as an obstacle. Altruistic, that's when parent kills child out of love, kind of like with Andrea Yates. And acutely psychotic, that's where there's no comprehensible motive and parent kills child because of the psychosis and how they have disassociated from the real life. So this is by psychiatry professor Philip Presnick. He is the one that has done most of this research. Listen, Resnick, love you, respect you, hope you get your downtime as well. <laughs> so in this case, I have put unwanted child filicide because I'm fully convinced that at certain points, she first of all, she knew she was having a child, she didn't do anything to prevent it from happening again, and again, and again, and again, again. And there, there are certain points in this story when, again, she didn't have to do any of that. She could have reported it. I don't think it was fully mental health because she was consciously doing certain things. She was consciously moving the bodies and everything that we discussed before. So unwanted child filicides are usually committed because the child is no longer wanted. This is the most common motive. But also, it happened because of the mental illness. So actually, the 2013 study from the UK that examines filicides in England and Wales between 97 and 2006 found that 40% of filicide offenders had a recorded mental illness. Other risk factors are the relationship breakdowns, the post-separation parenting disputes. In this case, it probably wasn't the most like stable or relationships, again, just making me think because she never told her husband any of this. And she, at certain point, did have a child with him. And also because, well, uh, the children weren't of the same dad. So that's probably why she wasn't telling him of the pregnancies in the first place. And that's probably the primary thing that kind of just, you know, consolidates for me this unwanted child as a motive. Because... If she was to say to her husband, okay, yeah, we're having a child, like, what if he was to find out that it wasn't his, then that would disturb her whole life. Like, she wouldn't be able to just go go to work, like, she would be exposed, everybody would learn about it, and, and then probably after that second child and the first disposal, the first murder... Well, she couldn't do that again. She couldn't approach her husband and be like, hey, I'm pregnant. Because now if she has the health checks, if she goes to get herself checked in the hospital, etc., they will find out that she was pregnant twice and not just once, as they knew. So at a certain point, I think between her first trial, the one that's actually alive, and the second one that she realized she doesn't really want because it's not her husband's one, she just made the decision. And that just set in place the course of actions, and then there was the point of no return. And I looked a bit into preventing filicide because I find it interesting, and because I think it is so hard. But again, this case didn't seem to be like super freaking hard to notice that somebody was pregnant. But then again, as a co-worker, you're like, what if she is going through miscarriage? Like show that you give a fuck like the fact that you're a co-worker doesn't mean like you're some person on the street passing a woman by and then just notice like oh hey she's had a tummy oh i'm passing on the second day no we actually know each other like fucking give a fuck what i was thinking in this particular case this is not like preventing homicide preventing well filicide but when the children are a bit older because at that point probably your household isn't the best so like social services did come around and have noticed everything. However, in this case, like, what do you know? Like, you have no idea until, unless you spot a pregnancy, unless they have gone for health checks, and then you have checked them as well, mentally to see, like, is everything okay? It's really hard to prevent something like this. So what can be done? People have suggested early screening and identification of mental illness during pregnancy and the postpartum to be crucial. There is a scale called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, 
And that's a validated tool that can be easily administered both during pregnancy and postpartum to like check how the person is doing. This next bit I find super interesting and it's again done by Resnick as a research. And that is when clinicians are assessing like the mental state of the mother to focus on harming the children. So the normal thing during the pregnancy is for mom to have fears of harming a child, like the legitimate fears of like, you know, not knowing what to do in certain situations and like what could harm a child, how to hold them, etc. But then obviously the cause for concern would be when the mother is imagining harming the children. Like it's more of a Not a fantasy, but it's not really a fear. So identifying the line between the two. And the clinician should also assess whether the thoughts and fears are due to the OCD, depression or psychosis. So the mothers with OCD can still experience the thoughts of harming the baby, but the thoughts would be more egodystonic, so more related to the ego and more related to fears rather than plans, like rather than, you know, this is something that I'm going to put into action. And factors that would lead to psychiatric hospitalization include maternal fears of harming their children, delusions of the child's suffering, and improbable concerns about the child's health. And the one that's hardest to prevent, could you spot it? It's the spousal revenge filicide, because you, it just comes with no warning. You don't know what's in somebody's head. So that truly is the end of this case, and it is the, the food for thought. As, as you wish, because, yeah, you truly don't know what's in somebody's head. But guess what? You're going to your next Zoom call, and you know how you can find out what's in somebody's head by asking them. Wild, 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 wild. wild. Just ask people, hey, so I've heard about this episode on Philly sites, hypothetical situation. Let's say you notice that I have gained some weight, and it's not in a gaining weight kind of flabby situation it's like i have developed in trimesters like it's very obvious that it's pregnancy stomach rather than i gain weight stomach what do you do do you approach me why yes why not what do you tell me why yes why not normalize this fucking talk in the offices because you might as well save not one life but possibly two Or, I mean, if she was to have more than one children in that stomach, possibly a couple. Or just test your friends to see, like, how they would react. Because this is not being talked about. Because, yes, you might think it doesn't happen. It's not as common as, I don't know, homicides, as murders. However, what would you do in that kind of situation? Hypothetical or not? And what does that mean for you as a person? What does that tell you about yourself as a person? Like, Do you care about your colleagues as you would about your friends? Do you care about your friends as if they're your real motherfucking friends? Like, As if they're family? And do you care about your family the way you care about yourself? Because those are truly the questions that need to be asked. Because in my head, this woman did not have any friends. And that's ultimately so sad. But just ultimately a bummer of a case that could have been prevented. Possibly... A few of those, actually, could have been prevented if somebody just spoke up. So hit me up at the socials that I'm part about what are your thoughts on this case. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Do you think it was a completely different motive? If you're from Finland, Finnair, is it cold? Is it cold on every flight? <laughs> but until next Monday, you keep making the world a better place by giving a fuck and asking questions at any time, appropriate or not, and not buying the greasy pizza answer. That would also be great, yeah. So, yeah, keep making the world a better place, one motive at a time. Bye, fuckers.